that's that's good. So well, welcome everybody. Um, so under you know uh, not the ideal um, conditions. Um, so the care of my kid is is close. So um, we are. My wife is teaching. My toddler watching cartoons, and I'm trying to uh, give you this presentation. But I'm really I'm really happy and really eager to to hear your your comments. Okay, so um, this paper is essentially um, part of a research agenda. I will briefly talk about that. And okay, I'm forced to not speak up. So essentially, okay, good. So um, okay, Fran. Okay, okay, okay. So um, well, this is a joint. Uh, project with David Stadelman uh, from the University of Bayreuth. Um, the, the project essentially is still work in progress. So every comment at this moment is, is, really, is really welcome. So we don't yet have a fully uh, working, uh, working paper version. So essentially this is the first, first second times that we are presenting this, this paper and David is doing exactly the same thing in, in Germany. Okay, so Couple of ideas of uh, where this paper belongs. So there is a very uh, huge, I would say, research agenda um, that focus on studying legislative outcomes. And you can study that from a theoretical perspective. You can run uh, lab experiments if you want. And we can also go to observational data. So um, the contribution of uh, this research agenda is essentially trying to test theoretical results uh, mainly using observational data. So that is where this project belongs. Um, we have some previous work um, on this research agenda. One is on uh, fiscal outcomes in a federation using data from, from Argentina and the effects of malapportionment in Congress on those fiscal outcomes. And probably closer to the current project is another paper using Switzerland data on uh, the effects of different uh, electoral rules on uh, legislative representation, also with David Stadelman and Marco Portman. So the idea of this paper is try to say something about uh, which are the key actors that influence uh, legislator and what is the weight of each of these uh, key actors. Um, if you think about this problem from a theoretical point of view, you may even consider that, you know, your theoretical background is almost trivial no, or, or evident, no? It's clear that legislative uh, legislators uh, are influenced by multiple players and immediately comes to our mind the usual suspects, okay? Voters, special interest groups, and um, uh, political parties. So that's exactly the type of framework that we have in mind. Uh, but uh, if you want to go and formalize more of this, uh, what we have is uh, models of common uh, agency and essentially the idea is that the legislator is the agent of several principles and the principles are these kind of actors, could be voters, special interest groups, could be parties or a combination of these different principles. From our perspective, the most important uh, implication of these formal models is that at the end, uh, they end up putting weights on each principle, okay? And that's exactly what we, what we are going to do here, but we want to do that empirically, okay? So you immediately see the connections with a lot of literature, especially in policy science. I am just mentioning here two things. Uh, there is a huge literature on the role and relevance of special interest groups, and there's a huge literature on party discipline in the legislative process. So I am just cherry picking some papers there, but the, the literature is, is really huge there. So as you probably, uh, uh, realize now, essentially the key point of this paper is not the theoretical model, it's mainly an empirical paper. And here in these slides, I would like to summarize what are the empirical challenges of essentially assigning weights to different principles. So the first challenge, empirical challenge that we have is that politicians' decisions usually are observable. So legislators, you can go and see how they vote. But usually we do not really observe voters' preferences. 
Sometimes they're observed indirectly through elections or to public opinion surveys, but they are not the same as the preferences of the voters over a specific legislative proposal. The second challenge is that uh, we don't, uh, we, usually we don't have preferences of special interest groups over a particular legislative proposal. Something similar happened for parties, okay? And on top of that, it's difficult to connect the interest groups of uh, the interest group with legislators. So sometimes uh, the lobby system is so opaque that we don't really have that link between different interest groups and the legislators. So what we do with this, um, this data set from Switzerland is that we are able to essentially overcome all these empirical issues. And essentially, this is coming from uh, Switzerland specifical institutional features that allow you to do that. And let me summarize in a, in a minute what are those features that allow us to overcome these uh, empirical challenges. So the first one is that, well, as, as it usually in almost every legislate, uh, like every Congress, so we can observe what members of parliament vote. But on top of that, we can observe what voters uh, want on a specific legislative proposal, because in Switzerland, there are a lot of referendums. Okay, and these referenda, essentially, they are equally worded uh, legislative proposals. So people vote yes or no. Yes means exactly the same piece of legislation that enters into Congress. You want that. No means you want status quo. So essentially, uh, voters, when they vote in a referendum in Switzerland, they are voting exactly the same thing that uh, members of parliament are voting. And of course, we have the data on what happened in each canton or with the, uh, with the referendum, right? Second thing is that the interest groups, they give a voting rec recommendation for each referendum. So they reveal what they want for each uh, referendum. And we have a variety of interest groups, you know, commercial associations, uh, unions, church association, whatever. The, the most important interest groups of the country are in our data set, and they reveal what they want for each referendum as a voting recommendation for the uh, voters. Parties do exactly the same thing. There is an official recommendation of the parties for each referendum. And finally, we have transparency laws that allow us to match the politician, each politician, each legislator with the interest groups. So essentially each legislator needs to fully reveal what are the interest groups uh, connected with, uh, with him or her. And then that data is publicly available. So essentially with that, we can connect the interest groups with each, uh, with each politician. So as you see, this is a very particular environment that allow us essentially to overcome the main empirical challenges. And that's what we exploit in this, in this paper. So summary of results. Uh, first of all, if you go and see descriptive data, the immediate thing that you will observe is that the preferences of voters, especially interest groups and parties are positively correlated, okay? Um, the second thing, so, so essentially it's uh, the preferences of the different principles, they are not always aligned, but overall there is some positive alignment, okay? The second thing is, uh, second finding is that uh, all principles influence the voting behavior of MP. It's not that for some principles, the coefficients are not significant, they're always significant, okay? So an immediate implication of this is that if we uh, try, if we miss the preferences of one principle, let's say, I don't know, special interest groups or the party, we are introducing a bias in the estimation of the uh, importance of the other principle, okay? So uh, of course that we have the preferences of all the principles, when, so we run our regressions with those, uh, with all the principles, and with that we are able to compute the weight that on average a legislator assigns to each principle. And this is the main result that we get, around 10% for voters, around 17% for interest groups, and around 72% for the party. And if you add up all those weights, 
they almost add up to 100%. So essentially there's little room for the personal ideology of the legislator or any other characteristic of the legislator once you account for the three main principles, okay? So um, I have, of course, tables in which I can formally show you the estimation of this, but I'm trying to summarize uh, the results. The other thing that we focus is um, what happens in situations of conflict of interest, because those are particularly important. So what the legislator will do when voters want one thing and the special interest groups want a different thing, okay? Those cases are very informative of a kind of a harsh trade-off for the legislator. Um, this is essentially a very simple tail table that show you that essentially what we are getting is that the preferences of voters or the constituents' preferences tend to be neglected. So with their conflict of interest, essentially the party and the interest groups uh, tend to kind of uh, have more weight than the, than, than the voters, okay? And so there are several ways of seeing this. For example, um, look at this uh, 0 0.972 in this table. And then if you move to the right, you are going to see a 0 0.611. Okay, so this is essentially uh, the probability that the legislator vote yes when all the interest groups vote with all the principals vote yes. So essentially you get almost 100% yes, no, 97%. But what happened when the, um, when the party say no, still the voters say yes, still the interest groups say yes, that number goes to a little bit more than 60%. Okay, and then I don't want to go over all the cases here, but you always get more or less the same idea. Okay, when the voters want something different from what the party wants, essentially they, they are heavily penalized. Okay, so I am really interested in, the, um, in, in having time to discuss the paper, so there are more results, but I wanted just to summarize the main, uh, the main ideas and move on as soon as possible to the a Q and A uh, component of this presentation, which I think is the most, at least for me, is the most interesting one. Gustavo, I can help keep track of, um, okay, uh, thanks, of people yes. on the chat I, if that would be helpful for you. Yeah, that would be nice. So it's, I am, I have the chat open. I'm not seeing questions so far. So I, I have questions. I can also start with the questions if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, please go ahead, Jess. Thank you. Okay, I have two questions. So first of all, I think this is wildly important as a political scientist, right? Like um, the sort of accountability, responsibility, how we think, how we think about um, who politicians are actually responding to. My two questions um, are as follows. First, and I apologize, uh, you know that I'm in the same situation as you are with daycare, so I did not get to read the paper very carefully, uh, or totally really at all. But um, were you able to look at whether um, the issue area matters in terms of whether, I mean, these are, the sample size is not huge, right? So I, I imagine you might have some problems being able to interpret your results, but I'm curious as to whether issue area might matter. And more broadly, I have a question, which is that you know, one of the reasons why you're able to study Switzerland and, and use that data to answer this question is about transparency, right? Which is really <laughs> awesome in a way in a way that, that we don't have here in the US, right? And so my question is really about, um, sorry, my, my kiddo is weighing in here. Um, my, my question is really about whether you think that we have a little bit of, bit of um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle going on here. In other words, does the fact that you can study this alter the results? So would you, so I might, for instance, expect that in the US, you know, like, so, so for instance, if, um, if we didn't have these transparency results, do you think, for instance, that interest group preferences would weigh even more strongly because you wouldn't be able to observe them and therefore voters wouldn't be able to observe them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or do you have any thoughts of, I mean, right, this speaks to broader questions of generalizability, right? In a context in which these things aren't transparent, do we think that they're going to play out very differently? Um, and do you have any thoughts on how to proceed in thinking about the broader question of generalizability, given the wonderful context of Switzerland <laughs> that you get to study this? So I will stop there and then I will try to keep a, a bit of a cue um, for the chat. So after me, it looks like uh, Sally is next. 
Okay, so awesome comments. Uh, should I go um, and try to answer your questions or we go first to more questions? It's, it's, it's the same for me. I think right now we just have one next on the queue that I can see. And so maybe it makes sense to answer that question and then we'll go to Sally while other people come up with their um, their thoughts and ideas. Awesome, Shays. Okay, good. So a first point is, uh, well, thank you very much. Those are very interesting uh, comments. Uh, issues, uh, yes, you may run into, you know, a number of observation issues as a small sample thing, but uh, I think we, we did it um, wherever possible. Uh, so two comments there. First of all, uh, you have referendum on very different issues. So essentially, this is not like a super biased samples that you get only environmental things or only, I don't know, gun control things. It's like you, you have a, a, a kind of a wide variety of, of, of issues. The overall picture doesn't seem to, uh, to vary, uh, but we haven't fully explored, uh, you know, if you get some heterogeneity effects by issue, essentially. Uh, overall, it's true that party matters more than interest groups, interest groups matter more than, uh, than voters, but the, the intensity of those differences could vary if you focus, let's say, on economics versus social issues. So that's something that we can, we can definitely check um, and, and it's probably interesting to, to see. Um, okay, the second question. Yes, I, I thought about that. Um, and yes, you enter into these issues is that the only way of, of estimating these things is if you have some kind of transparency law. But yes, you may wonder is uh, what happened when you do not have uh, a transparency law and then essentially the lobby system becomes more opaque for voters. And then I think I agree with you that uh, overall things will move in the direction of uh, probably giving more, more weight to, to special interest groups because essentially you essentially don't know what is going on. Um, but, but yes, you are, we are running into these problems that essentially whenever you can estimate things is because um, you, you have some transparency law. Something that we can check, um, my understanding is that for Switzerland, for our sample period, this transparency law was always there, uh, but uh, we can check if for other countries, there are some reforms in transparency law. So for example, the most interesting scenario for us would be something that make the transparency laws regarding special interest groups, you know, uh, tougher. Okay, or you know, more intense or more serious transparency law. So that could give you some, you know, different diff possibilities estimating the before and after the transparency law. And at the very minimum, we can check the literature on transparency laws that I'm sure there is literature there. But yes, uh, I think it's a very interesting comment. Um, uh, yeah, what, what we can do in the paper is um, probably we cannot exploit a variation in transparency law for Switzerland because the transparency law has been there for a whole sample period. But at the very least, we can check the literature on transparency laws and what people has been, you know, have been finding in those in those uh, in those empirical papers. Okay, good, very very interesting point. Very interesting point. Thanks, Jess. Great, thanks. Those are uh, super fascinating comments. Um, and I think that that would make sense if you can if you can do that uh, with a different diff. Okay, um, so right now I think we only have uh, Sally Asun on on the queue, and so if other folks have thoughts or comments, uh, maybe let me come up with it. Oh, and then Jamie. So Sally, and then Jamie. Yes, can you hear me well? Yeah, yes. I can. Yes. So uh, great presentation, great paper, uh, Gustavo. My question is about. A measurement in page 18, you measure, you define, you know, your measurement of special interest groups focused on an aggregate dynamic, which is uh, whether a majority of the special interest groups favors the legislative proposal or not. So it's a binary variable between one and zero. But since in your paper, you focus on really uh, micro dynamics associated with each legislator, I thought, you know, maybe you could introduce another variable for uh, in, for interest group measurement in terms of uh, matching between the stance of the interest group and the position of the MP. So whether, you know, whether the interest group 
support matches with the voting decision of the MP, it's a success and you know it's a failure otherwise. So I thought in this way you could you know focus more on the microdynamics than what you have now. It's still very fascinating, but that's that's an idea that came up to my mind when I was reading your paper. Thanks. Okay, Sally, thank you very much. That's a, a super, super nice comment. Um, so, um, okay. So the reason we are presenting everything in kind of zero one is because we wanted to keep the, uh, the, main, um, the main specification as simple as possible. And essentially it's very simple to understand. It's like voters are essentially, you vote in favor or against the, the referendum. The, each MP is essentially exactly what the MP is doing, is like vote in favor or not. That's the way the parties give the recommendation. That's the way the special interest groups give the recommendation. But it's perfectly possible to develop continuous variables. So essentially, you can have proportion of your interest groups that favor uh, a, a referendum, okay? Um, I think we run regressions are not yet in the paper, but we have done. Uh, results do, do, do not change essentially if you um, if you move from kind of zero one um, uh, variables to you know continuum variables. Uh, what we have not explored. So okay, if okay, maybe it's kind of a little bit cheap way of interpreting your your comment. So if you refer to that, uh, essentially uh, we we have done that. Um, it, it, not big change in the results. But I think your comment go to something even more interesting, no? Uh, can we say something more dynamic, essentially, if your special interest groups vote uh, in favor or a proportion say yes to one referendum, if there is some kind of dynamic lane, then in the future, in the future referendum, what is going on? Uh, can we link one referendum decision with the other? We can't explore anything in that direction but we can try, okay, we can try. So um, essentially, I kind of, you know, it's well taken the, the, um, the comment, if interpretation is more on how to define the preferences of the different principles, we have tried different measurements, not much of a change, okay, there. So it tends to be that the special interest groups associated with the legislator there, there is not huge dispersion of what they want, okay? So you don't lose a lot if we go for on a, you know, discrete, run, discrete variable versus a continuous variable. And that's the reason the results do not change. But we can't explore anything related to the, the dynamical thing. And if you have any comments on how to do that or what do you think could be interesting, uh, that would be very, very interesting for us. Uh, thank you. I don't have any further comments for now, but this answers my question. Okay, good, good. Awesome comment. Thank you very much. All right, I think next is Jamie and then Diego from what I can see. Great. Um, this is a really cool paper, Gustavo. Um, thank you. And I think it just, yeah, I think it opens up so many, so many really interesting questions. I was really fascinated by the fact that um, personal ideology, like there was just no room for it in your study. Um, but is that like, is that re like, is that really reflective of, of voting preferences on behalf of legislatures or legislators? I mean, um, because it seems like we know, it seems like legislators do have voting personal preferences, even if they are swayed by other people. And so like, that's the hard part to study and to define. Have you, I, I'm going to guess you guys have tried <laughs> and assuming that, like what problems did you encounter? Okay, good, good point. So essentially it, it, it's not that it's completely, completely irrelevant, the, um, the ideology of the, of, the, um, of the legislators, but essentially two, two ways of thinking about this, okay? So the first one is, something that we tried in the paper that you that you you see okay so this version okay and essentially one way of thinking about this is what if we explore some heterogeneous effects and then essentially we don't have a lot of data but we have some characteristics like female male uh elder or younger um politician and then something that you observe is that 
um, as politicians get older, um, it, it seems that essentially uh, they pay less attention, uh, I think, to voters and overall to all principles. Okay, so um, uh, overall, it's there is not a lot of room for ideology, but the little room for ideology it seems to be concentrated mainly in relatively older um, uh, politicians. Okay, and the way we interpret that is, well, uh, you are kind of getting older. And then you start running with uh, cases in which they are not expecting to be reelected. So they are very close to retirement, okay? So essentially, they don't care anymore about the interest groups or, or they care less about the interest groups, the voters, they care less about the principles overall. And essentially, they vote just following their own conscience, no? So that's that's one, one way of thinking about that. But... Um, I think we also find that this group in, within this group of politicians, something that is going on is that those put more weight on the party, okay? So less weight overall to all the principles, the model explain less the, their behavior, but the relative weight that they put on the party is more. So essentially, somehow they are kind of, there's, there's some kind of idea that they are selected uh, those politicians that I stay aligned with the, with the party and they have less chances to, you know, have a, a prosperous career, those that uh, enter into more conflict with the, with the party, okay? So that would be one way of kind of trying to answer your question. And that's exactly what is reflected in the draft that you, um, uh, that I circulated. But right now we are exploring a different approach. So I said in this paper, Kind of 10 days ago, um, somebody suggested that essentially what is going on is that with party preferences, what we are capturing is like core voters or, you know, these loyal voters versus what you are capturing with voters is more those pivotal voters, swing voters, okay? So those voters that can vote for you or may not vote for you. So essentially what we are finding uh, or one way of reading our findings is that this uh, high weight for the party indeed what captured is that there is high weight for loyal voters, like core voters that are, you know, partisan voters, if you want, that are always there. And then, of course, that if they are very partisan, uh, they are kind of very ideologically aligned with their leaders in the party and the and the, and, the, and the legislators are part of the party, but essentially somehow with party, you are capturing the ideology of all, the ideology of uh, the party, the ideology of the, of, the, of the legislators and the ideology of that core constituency of the party, okay? So that would be a different, a different way of thinking about this problem. Unfortunately, in order to answer uh, that question and see what is the importance of this mechanism. Essentially, we need to collect more data, uh, but there is data available to do that. There are exit poll uh, surveys, and then uh, after the referenda, so we can we can get that data and see essentially uh, the voters as kind of ideologically aligned, aligned with the party, how they vote compared to the majority of voters. So this will allow us essentially, at least for a survey, not for all, but for a survey, be able to identify your core constituency versus the overall constituency or the majority of the constituency in your canton, okay? So again, uh, two ways of interpreting, I think, your question. The first one kind of already addressed in this draft. The second one, from my perspective, more interesting, uh, but we, are, we don't know the answer. We are working on, on, on trying to get an answer for that. Okay, great. It looked like Jamie, you had a follow up, right? And then, uh, and then Diego yeah. is going to go. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the question of course, about, um, the preferences of legislators and it you know, comes from like Buchanan and Vincent Ostrom who argued that, you know, people actually do have preferences, even if they claim that they're not, even if they're part of the administration, 
I personally think that's still really important to examine. Like, I just find it hard to believe that there's, you know, less than 1% of preferences, personal preferences or ideology expressed in the voting patterns. Um, and Swedish cantons may be different, but I know here in the US, um, like you're talking about the core constituency and like what they value and, and what they tell you. In the US, that information is available through um, primary or public records, particularly with regards to primary voting, because um, you can see who are the consistent voters in just about every election. And that's you know, who like political candidates target whenever they want to you know, get out the vote. Do you find a similar situation in Switzerland where you have similar data or um, do you have less to work with over there? Okay, so in, in it is, it, it's kind of exactly the opposite. You have better data in Switzerland. So essentially it, it may be like zero one, I vote yes or no, but they are all revealing their preferences for a specific legislative proposal. While in primaries or in any election, you are essentially voting a bundle of issues uh, and then you don't know. So for example, you can disagree with the candidate uh, social platform, but you can strongly agree with the economic platform of that part of that uh, of that uh, of that like the platform of that party, and then you vote for that party, but you don't. You are then if you have to vote on a referendum on a social issue, you go you vote against that party. No, so essentially part of the problem of using uh, just uh, election data or surveys surveys of you know. Uh, Public opinion surveys usually they ask voters about you know general ideological issues. Okay, you are more left wing or red wing, liberal or conservative, in several dimensions, and in some cases yes, but in not but it's not it's not common that they ask about are you in favor or against a specific legislative proposal, and it's not even the same as saying you are in favor or against a general issue. Okay, because then, so for example, let's let's consider, I don't know, abortion. And then you ask in a survey, are you in favor or against? Something like, well, but, but you're not asking about the specific legislative proposal. So essentially, uh, what we have here is essentially that people, so say no means the status quo, all the back, all the laws that are already there, stay there, it's just a status quo. And then uh, essentially, when you are saying yes, what you mean is that this legislative proposal, exactly worth it, I favor that, okay? So again, my answer to your question is like, yes, maybe you have less information in terms of intensity of the preferences, but it's really clear and comparable across different actors, and that is very rare in, in US data. You, you see what, what we are able to exploit here in the in the case of, of, of Switzerland. No? And then, yes, I agree with you as a general point that the, the ideology of the politicians could, could matter, but remember that you have essentially kind of uh, electoral forces putting the politicians, you, you know, there is a selection effect and then a re-election effect. And then my feeling is that if you are really, really adopt with what the principals want, uh, essentially you lose elections. So you are you are not even in the sample, essentially. So there are also a lot of pressures to, you know, um, put, you know, uh, align the, the politicians that, uh, that have preferences, even if it's a type, okay? So for example, I am liberal, okay? It's this bunch of issues, okay? Good, or you are conservative, okay? But essentially, the person that is picked or elected uh, among different potential alternatives is not something exogenous. That's something endogenous. So essentially, the person that end up being elected, the ideology of that person somehow needs to be connected with what voters, the party, and the interest group wants. Okay. So once once you think things from that perspective, we shouldn't be that surprised that the politicians, that the ideology of the politician that end up in Congress somehow is connected with the ideology of these principles, no? And then in some sense, the, the weird case will be a case in which you are elected somebody with an ideology completely opposed to 
what voters want, interest groups want, and the party want. That's kind of the weird case. So essentially, that would imply that essentially uh, no, there are no political economy game, if you want. Electoral forces are not working, lobby is not working, uh, parties are not working. Essentially. So essentially, everything I think in policy science or in political economy will tell you that at least some of those forces should be working. But at the same time, I agree with you, there is a residual, and this residual in this estimation looks too small. I would expect a little bit more there. Okay? And in that sense, I agree with your, with your comment. Okay, I think Diego is next, and then the queue is sort of open, although I have another question, but I will not, uh, I, would, I would wait if there are others that um, would like to weigh in. Okay, go ahead, Diego. Good. Okay, how are you? Very good work. It's very far from my field, therefore, in advance, I apologize if, if I cannot organize my ideas properly. Um, but I was wondering, um, the idea is to identify who is the real boss of the of the legislator, right? The full uh, paper is trying to analyze how to do that. Um, I'm not sure how is the this this country specifically in terms of referendums, if there is for the full legislations things or just for very specific ones. Why am I am saying that? Because, for instance, in Colombia we have referendums only for things that are very, very, very controversial. Therefore, it means that the full country even is complex to try to define how, how we can go. And when you put the referendum, eh, you are also trying to feel how the full people is feeling these kind of things. And obviously, the legislators are going to align more closely to the general view because they want to be reelected, simple. If, however, if we try to analyze similar things with less important legislation, let's say that the people is not very conscious about what they are doing. Usually legislators are doing things more connected with the interest groups or lobby things or whatever. Therefore, my question here would be, do you believe that having the referendum as the, as the way to study that will change radically the results if it's done with a legislation and that is not done like this way and how we can try to apply the same principles of this one to the other thing. Okay, thanks. That's, that's an interesting question. So um, a couple of, of comments. So there is one particular institutional feature about Switzerland that I think is very different from uh, let's say Colombia or other, or other types of, of referendum. Okay. It, Give me a second. So my kid is interrupting me. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> OK, wait a second. Okay, so sorry about that. So it's a renegotiation with my, my toddler. More chocolate, I had to give him. Okay, um, okay a couple of, of comments about the, uh, the institutional differences between Switzerland and let's say uh, Colombia. In, in many Latin American cases, it is similar, okay? So um, in Colombia, it's relatively cheap to generate a referendum. So essentially, the threshold for the number of signatures that voters need to come up in order to trigger a referenda is, re is relatively low. Uh, and as a consequence, there are a lot of those referenda. So essentially, um, they are not necessary about like big issues that the political system cannot essentially uh, solve. And then the referendum is, you know, we go to voters because the parties cannot agree about these big issues. Like, I don't know, negotiation with the FARCs in Colombia would be an, an example. So uh, you, you have like much smaller things and much more specific things. The other big difference between uh, Colombia, uh, let's say Colombia and, 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 and Switzerland is that in this, in this case, in the cases of Latin American countries, usually the referendum is about like a general questions, like do you support an agreement with the FARC with some of these features or not? 
Uh, and then there are a lot of, this is a very incomplete, essentially, uh, proposal, no? Here in Switzerland, there is a clear proposal. It's the bill, essentially. You vote in favor or against the bill, okay? So that's, that's I think, it's, it's, a, it's, a huge, uh, it's a huge difference, no? Um, so, uh, th so that's one thing. The second is, uh, be, be careful about this idea that essentially uh, politicians will always uh, follow what one principal wants, essentially with voters wants or, or with special interest groups or parties. So this is essentially a, just summary statistics of the conditional probability, okay? So for example, look at this case, the first row here. Voters or constituents say no, okay? Uh, and then what is the probability that the interest groups say yes? Okay, that is, you know, 35%, okay? Or for example, constituents say yes, what the probability that the party uh, say, um, say yes, Seven, 72%. So essentially, there are a lot of cases. So there is a, there is a so the interest groups say yes, 72%. A party say yes, another 71%. So essentially, there are a lot of alignment, but at the same time, there are a lot of cases of conflict of interest where the party is recommending you to do something different from uh, interest groups or from voters. Okay. So in those cases, you have to think about what is uh, your best choice as a legislator. And then um, be careful about the electoral incentives there, because uh, of course you want to take into account what voters want, but special interest groups then give you contributions and they're very important. And the party also help you a lot during the campaigns. So essentially, even if you only care about the probability of re-election, you should not only take into account uh, the voters, you also need to take into account the party and you also need to take into account the special interest groups. So I think the main mes message of these models that take into account different players is that essentially, even if you only care about the probability of re-election, you put some weight on everybody, okay? Um, voters give you just the vote, uh, special interest groups give you money, and money give you advertisement, advertisement give you votes. The, the party give you, you know, uh, endorsement, uh, they can assign or not an internal competition to your uh, to your position. They can also give you contributions or not. They can help you in the campaign or not. And that also translates into votes. So essentially true that at the end of the road you have votes, but in the middle there is some kind of, you know, black box process that converts the uh, what you do or what you propose to do with the preferences of different groups. And then essentially, uh, that thing connect the um, indirectly in some cases and directly in some cases with votes, no? So it's not it's not really clear, um, even if you only care about the priority of re-election, why you, sh you should not pay attention to one principle or the other, okay? And I'm not sure if I got your question right, but please let me know if I... If I took it in the wrong in the wrong direction. Oh yes, that is just how these principles could be applied for for trying to understand who is the real boss in another situation that is not referendum, because it will probably change. I see. I see. Okay, and then I know another thing is um, bigger or smaller issues. I think it's related with the first question by Shes is. How we, how we check issues. And I think overall the story is the same. So uh, we have some, some referendums that refer to constitutional reforms and then some others that refer to smaller topics. And I think the overall picture of the results are essentially the, the same. Okay. Um, so I think Tonya was next, but I was curious, Tonya, if other, I had a question that was like kind of right on this point. Um, so is yours also right on this point or should I just quickly interject? Um, you can interject, Jess. Okay, it's just really quick. Yeah, it had to do with this. Um, Diego's point made me think also about the extent to which if you have data on the timing of these referenda, then that black box process about when immediate voter support matters versus 
um, more indirect forms of it might matter, right? Like the, the media voter support would matter right, right before an MP election, right? But um, we might think that, that um, the capacity for interest groups or particularly parties, for instance, to nominate different competitors might happen a little bit earlier. And so I'm curious if you have any temporal controls like so some sort of um, hazard model, maybe as you approach an election, <laughs> would you expect different principles to matter differently, in part based on the way in which they can affect the likelihood of that of that election, right? So that the mode in which they like, right? So you made this very convincing argument that, you know, even if you only care about getting reelected, it's not just about the votes, these other principles matter, right? And so if that's the case, we would actually expect them to matter differently at different points in time in particular at different temporal distances from the election. And so I'm curious if that's something you considered or might consider moving forward in terms of thinking about under what conditions, particularly at what point in time, vis-a-vis -vis an election, these principles um, uh, uh, matter more or less. And then I will, See. I promise I will be quiet because I believe it is Sonia Sack return. And then we have one wonderful comment that I'm trying to figure out who wrote it here. <laughs> um, okay, go ahead. Okay, should, should I wait for the, should I answer uh, that one? Or yeah, go ahead and answer the... that, then Tonya, and then, uh, and then Wes has a wonderful um, uh, comment in the, in the, in the, in the queue. So Tonya next, I and see. then Wes. Okay, good. So she has very nice comments. So uh, easy answer is um, doable, but we haven't done it. I would be interested to see the, the results. Um, general point, I think what you are su suggesting is Something that we are we are essentially going in that direction is can we exploit something that change the cost or the benefit of satisfying one principle? No, and then what you are suggesting is essentially this time variation um, would would essentially give us uh, something in, in in something something of a sort. Okay, so um, I was you know, assuming thinking, that you know, the theoretical frame is about elections, right? It could be something else. But if you're interested, particularly in a re-election, then that you know exactly. Yes, so I think uh, I think we, we, we can do that, and definitely are referendums that are not that do not coincide with with um, with elections. So uh, and of course they are closer or further away from elections. So we can we can exploit that doable. Okay, nice, very nice comment. I think we'll we'll be able to do that. All right, Tanya, you're next, and then Wes. Okay, yeah, um, I. I, I guess um, I, I anticipate that your response might be somewhat um, similar to your response to Jess since uh, uh, it's kind of getting at that sort of um, variation and different settings in which these weights could change. Um, but I wasn't thinking so much temporally, but um, institutionally, like in terms of electoral institutions. So I don't know a lot about how um, legislators are elected in Switzerland, and I'm actually not sure. So maybe in a minute you could speak to that. But I know mm. I have to imagine that this has some influence as well on like who is considered and um, and their behavior even once they're elected because typically how you get elected um, and the kinds of campaign strategies you're going to use as a candidate like depend a lot on electoral rules, whether you're going to make appeals more to your political party, um, if you are just part of a party list um, and, you know, promoting the party matters, or if you are trying to make personal voting appeals to, um, to the constituency. So then you might be more maybe constituency and voter focused. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, how, how unique really is um, is Switzerland in that sense? And what kind of, um, I guess, group of cases of similar electoral arrangements could this at least speak to um, while maybe recognizing that there are other settings where it can't? Okay, so simple answer, I couldn't agree more. We have another paper <laughs> in which essentially we exploit different electoral rules for the upper and the lower house. And essentially, legislators are essentially chosen pretty much following exactly the same process except for the electoral rule. So we use that to estimate the effect of electoral rules on, on representation. Um, for this paper, 
essentially um, the, in the upper house, legislators are chosen using, using a um, majority rule. In the lower house, they are um, uh, elected according to a proportional rule. So in this case, we only want, we only focus essentially in the Senate. So we have uh, for each canton, essentially, you know what the majority wants essentially. So you can assign a one zero for the, the, for the voters and that's the preferences of the voters in the, in the referendum. Uh, and to avoid these problems as essentially in the, um, if you're elected with a proportional rule, you may be targeting just some, some you know, fraction of the, of, the, of the voters that are you know, ideologically aligned with your agenda. And we know that this is happening because our previous paper exactly uh, tells you that story that you are kind of targeting more the median voter when, the, when, the, um, when, the, when we are talking about an electoral, uh, a majoritarian electoral rule and can you, you know, the expected result for a proportional uh, uh, electoral rule kind of more widely dispersed kind of, all, not purely uniform, but close to uniformly dis dispersed on the, on the, on kind of on the zero one ideological spectrum. So um, that's the reason when we are talking about voters here, we we'll focus on cantons and essentially what we are focusing is on the Senate in order to avoid exactly the type of problems that you are, um, that you are suggesting. But if you have some idea for kind of better ways of, of doing that, uh, it's, it would be really, really welcome. So for the main model, we wanted, you know, kind of plain vanilla, uh, avoid the, you know, the potential confounding factors with electoral rules. And we just essentially focus on the, on the cantons and essentially on the Senate. So you know exactly what the majority of voters wanted in each electoral district, essentially. Okay, Thank you. It, look, it looks, oh, sorry, Tarn, did you have any, are you, uh, was that satisfactory answer? <laughs> oh, no, yeah, that, that, that definitely answers my question. Um, uh, I do wanna say like that this is super interesting. Like I just am like incentives of political behavior is like totally my thing. So um, really enjoyed this. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's I, I think you know um, I believe that it's it's I was always working with models that you know uh, consider these ideas, but be able to say something with data. It's kind of the first time that um, I find you know some kind of uh, environment that allows you to say something. It's not perfect. There are potential a lot of issues. I, I agree, uh, but I was kind of surprised on 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 the on the results in some in some sense and the possibility of doing something empirical. Okay. Okay, great. I might try to read out Wes's question really quickly here because we have about five minutes left. And while normally we'd like to stick around, I think I'm curious, Gustavo, if that's possible given your <laughs> your uh, situation at home there. So if you if you can, let us know. But I uh, fully recognize that that is uh, maybe a challenge right now. Yes, I can stay a little bit longer, but yes, it's like my window is closing. There. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Okay, so I'll read what, Wes's question out. As it sounds like he's had a little more internet trouble even even than I have. So. Here it goes. Um, I find your argument in the paper about how treatment effects are practically irrelevant to be really interesting, and I think I buy it. However, it does suppose that the weights that representatives um, uh, do not change. I'm not sure there might be something missing there. Do you expect these weights to change um, other than old age, for instance, correlating with ideology? Are there events or treatments that induce changes in the weights? For example, public riots could induce politicians to weight their constituents more heavily. For example, and, and I think this fits with the broader questions you've gotten about sort of dynamics um, and the ways in which um, these weights might be affected by various dynamics events. and heterogeneous yeah. effects. I think goes exactly. exactly in that direction. Totally agree. And sorry, that I don't have more results to show. I just show you what whatever I have at this moment. No? Okay, so it sounds like a lot of your comments and questions have really come in, in similar similar veins uh, in terms of good directions to take take the paper. Do you have any final thoughts or ideas uh, um, in response to some of these thoughts and questions, some closing remarks? Well, uh, okay, so a couple of, um, uh, so two ways 
of you know interpreting this this result. So what this result? So one way is essentially to start uh, thinking about uh, so take those results as given. So party interest groups, voters, and then start thinking why the parties are are so important, and then essentially kind of develop a theory of why in cases of conflict of interest the uh, the politicians tends to align with uh, with the party, which is not clear. So here we estimate the weights, but we don't really know why the weights are what they are, okay? The second avenue uh, is essentially to start saying, well, what do we really mean by the party, okay? So in some sense, that's a more philosophical question, push you more in the direction of, you know, deep thinking in political theory of parties as coalitions of what, essentially. Um, he, part of what I suggested on the empirical literature of essentially distinguishing between you know, core voters and swing voters, voters is, I think at some point we'll essentially run into the question of um, what do we mean by, by a political party, okay? So um, again, uh, those would be kind of my, my closing remarks because I think those are kind of open questions to keep going in this, in this literature. Um, and that I, I find myself, you know, particularly interested in both, both routes now. It's like thinking more carefully about why, and then their way of thinking is like, well, I don't fully buy this. It's like at the end, uh, parties should somehow be hidden voters, somehow, well, uh, make those hidden voters somehow explicit, uh, another way of, 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 another avenue for this project. And then of course, all the specific comments that I got, uh, they are really interesting. And then we have a lot of work to do to come up with a, you know, a better draft, I guess. Okay, well, again, I think uh, we, we really had some great comments there and I um, really appreciate a lot of people have had a lot of challenges today, I think, with uh, when it comes to internet, when it comes to childcare. So um, thanks you all for, for bearing with us a bit. And thanks to Gustavo for a great presentation. And maybe a few of us will hang around um, for a couple more minutes to continue chatting. Um, and uh, yeah, well done. Thanks to everybody for joining us again. And we'll Ooh, see you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for moderating. I, I know that, well, we are on the same boat with uh, childcare issues. <laughs> yes. This is uh, this is this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone.